AWS Loft Talks. Hi everyone, I'm Devrim from Coding. We founded the company in uh, 2011 and then we came to experience uh, 600,000 VMs uh, last year. So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, how that went. Since this is not an investor pitch, I'm going to talk to you about problems that we had versus you know, the stories that are you know, shiny and then we get some traction. So how do we end up back in Amazon? So first of all, what is coding? Coding is a platform where you sign up and we give you a VM. So basically that's it. And we give you a VM that is already configured uh, to run most of the applications. So you don't need to install stuff to your laptop. You don't have to install anything to your laptop. You could actually have your iPad connect an external keyboard and actually just go and clone something from uh, GitHub and play with it. Um, you could also do Rocket, you could also do Docker, you could, you know, you don't have to pollute your laptop with it. But what we want to do with coding is that coding is not an online ID, contrary to how it looks. We have an ID on the system, it almost is similar or analogous to an iPhone camera. So iPhone is not a camera. So coding is not intended to replace Sublime or Eclipse or anything, but it's just, it's intended to foster collaboration and easy onboarding. So up until today, we only focused on developers, individual developers. So we have 880 universities on the system today that they are doing training. The professors are actually teaching how to code to their students. As you see on the left side, whenever you are stuck, um, today you would go to Stack Overflow and then, you know, cut and copy a piece of your code and then say, I'm stuck here, so anybody could help me, and then you would start waiting. On coding, you say, I am stuck on line 17, and this guy will pop up with the team of developers, and then they will be able to like look at your code right away and then actually uh, hope to figure out your problem. Because most problems are not really technical or algorithmic, it's more like, you forgot to install something to your VM, or something just didn't install correctly, or configuration didn't really apply. So this guy will be able to just look at it and then go to your terminal and execute a couple of commands. In five minutes, you're uh, back to your project. So the point be behind coding is not, as I said, uh, let's make this awesome ID online. It's more like how do we actually bring 100 people together on a project? How do we actually make this a development environment? So as you see, we have a social component where you have the feeds and you have the private chat rooms and uh, very soon you'll be able to drag and drop your VMs into the chat room so everybody in that chat room will ha have access to those VMs. And then we are going to release uh, very soon the, uh, our binaries that, will, that you will install to your local hosts, that you'll install to your digital ocean machines, Amazon machines, and they will just show up here. So coding will contain all your VMs, all your friends or your colleagues, and then you will work together with them. So last year, we had the fork in the road. So we could say, we are going to target companies because companies have 10 people, 15 people, they want to work on projects and um, they need this kind of a collaboration tool on top of what they're building. But then we decided, let's go after developers. Let's see uh, how developers respond to a platform. And um, we, are, we were very proud that we actually passed million users this January and as of today, we, we are around 1.2. And uh, developers love the ability to not think about how to install things to their laptop. So if you have a Windows, that's a different installation. If you have Mac, different installation. And if you have different computers, and Linux is a different installation. If you have a Chromebook, there is no installation. So you have to have an environment like this to actually do your job. We are hoping to fix, in a month, we are going to release our early preview, uh, the Teams product, where you are going to say, using Rocket, Docker, Amazon VMs, DigitalOcean VMs, you'll be able to say, whenever someone joins my team, provision these servers, install stuff in there, and then your entire team will be available to help uh, your team members. So one more thing about the social part is that 
we didn't just thought, you know, social stuff is cool, so let's build it. It was actually a lot of work to build that part. The reason that we built it is I'm a software engineer since the age of reason, and I was doing software since I was 12. I had companies that I, I managed more than 100 developers, and the, the biggest problem that I had was actually when Daniel joins my group, joins my company, I had to sit down with him because Daniel comes up with this idea of, why don't we use Node.js? It's cool. Or why don't we just install this? That's like awesome. So you have to actually sit down with that person and say, you know what, we actually talked about that like three months ago with this 10 people. Let me forward those emails to you so you read it. And then you sit down with that person and say, you know what, if you have an infrastructure question, you go and find Justin. If you have JavaScript question, you find Mike. So this feed, whenever something happens in your development environment, say that your database is down, someone goes like, MySQL is down, hashtag MySQL. So next time you hire someone as a database admin, he will only click on the MySQL hashtag, and he will see everything that has ever talked about MySQL on your company. This gives you something very important, that some people in your company are more friendlier than others. So this new person will be able to find out who to ask the question to. He will be able to say, oh, Daniel is a good guy. He could help me out because he's helping everyone out. And there's this other guy, Mike, who is a jerk who doesn't really want to be asked a question. So he will be able to find out the dynamics of your team, which is uh, very important when you are onboarding an employee or a developer. So we had an amazing year where we saw a lot of VMs, a lot of compute hours. Actually, we had 160 million compute hours spent on coding only in 2014. Amazon people are here. We broke the Amazon dashboard because we spun up 600,000 VMs in December. So the UI was just not working. So we just couldn't see actually how much we were going to pay. And that's why I actually contacted Sumo Logic. How, could, how do we actually just find out what our bill is going to look like? In December, we made an a online hackathon, which ended up being the largest hackathon in the world. The 65,000 developers applied, 4,000 people selected, and then they uh, joined from 922 cities from around the world. They formed teams with each other, and then they actually submitted projects. So if you want to see the projects that have been submitted, uh, it's on coding.com forward slash hackathon. So coding is a couple of things. One, the lines of code is a vanity metric that people actually download code from GitHub and then we just actually count the lines of code, which kind of is an indicative of what people are doing. But here I'm going to talk about VMs and storage volumes, which we had a lot of problems with. The problem to us was, unfortunately, CoreOS didn't exist when we started, so that's the main problem. So we didn't have those cheap containers. Only thing we had was Amazon's M1 Smalls, which was 60 bucks a, a month. So Coding's vision was, let's give everybody in the world a VM, a root access VM, root accessible VM. So everybody called us crazy. So they were like, if you do that, everybody is going to attack each other, everybody is going to abuse the system, whatever. But we didn't believe that. We just, we were like, you know, that's how we learn how to code. That's what we need to do. So from Zen, we tried Zen, we tried to install it on our own, and then that was, it's a, it's a resource allocation at the time of a build. So you say, I'm going to give you one gigabyte RAM and one CPU. Zen allocates that. So if you have a 16 gigabytes of a host, you can only create 16 of those machines. So in order to get to a million, you can imagine how much money we had to spend and how many data centers we had to build. So that actually didn't work out. So the VMware is the same story. Then we found out OpenVZ is actually doing this quite good because it doesn't pre-allocate the VM. So if you're not using your VM, your one gigabyte is available to the other tenants in the same host. So we used that initially. Then Alexis, actually OpenVZ became an Alexi, and we started, uh, we started using an Alexi, and Alexi was, Alexi is the, you know, the beginnings of Docker as well, so it's a container, and it's very cheap. So we could actually create those VMs for a cent a month versus $60 a month on Amazon. So it, was, it looked like a great alternative until we found out how these things work. 
when someone does a fork bomb, LXCs didn't have orchestration, LXCs didn't have, like, if uh, you say you put 1,000 people on one machine and one does the fork bomb and that takes, takes the entire host down, so if 500 people are coding at the same time, since Core S didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to, like, put you on a different host and actually get you going. So they are progressing and they are doing great. But last year when we actually saw that spike of usage, we said to ourselves, like, how do you actually make sure everyone is secure and stable? And uh, CoreOS guys also uh, pointed out some uh, security limitations of the Docker so people actually could jail out of their roots. So if you are coding, you could get out of your Docker and get into other people's Dockers, and that is not a good thing to have. So we had other problems, say uh, scaling of Alexi. So what does that mean? So you have a lot of containers per host. Then initial testings were great. So we could actually do 1,000 LXEs per host. So say 1,000 Dockers, 1,000 Rockets. So that, that, that will be OK. But what we didn't do is we actually didn't download 5 gigs or 50 gigs of files to those VMs. So once you actually start using a lot of files in there, so I give you an account and then you go to GitHub and download something and then you have 5 gigabytes of a VM. And in coding scale, 10,000 people would come and try to log in, say, 9 a.m. in the morning. So coding then now needs to mount 10,000 disk images back to those containers. Then LXCs were great. They would boot up in one second only if we could mount those drives. So we could not mount those drives because then we would hit the I.O. bottleneck. So then, you know, the network isn't really uh, good enough to support that kind of a load. There is a problem of CPU spikes. So you create LXCs in one host, and then one person is using a lot of CPU, and your host has only limited amount of CPUs. So if they start using a lot of CPU, all the other hosts, all the other apps in the same host would start to slow down. So we have to come up with some sort of CPU limiting software. So we wrote that software, so if you actually use your CPU more than four seconds in a row, it would start to limit you, and then it would actually slow you down versus the host. Then we have the shared file system problem that is sold at Amazon in the name of EBS so that you could actually mount a network drive to your VM. In our case, we didn't have EBS, so when you have an LXC, you either use Gloucester or Ceph. So the Gloucester is a distributed file system, so it just mounts it as a big network drive, and then you would just give the certain part of it to the host. That didn't work for us because when you would, when you git clone something to your VM, Gloucester would first try to sync that git files to every node on, this, on the network before it would give it to you. Then you would, it was funny that we would git clone something and run your app and then it would just give you a random errors and then you would be like, what is going on? And it would end up being the git clone happened on one node, and it said it's successfully completed. When you want to actually run the application, it would try to read from the nodes that, isn't, that are not synced yet. So then it would lose files. So we figured out Ceph is a better alternative because it actually mounts the image of a file system. So we give you one, and Ceph gives you a block storage. And that block storage gets attached back to the LXC. And then that seemed to be like a good alternative. So we use that. Again, it didn't solve 10,000 block images being mounted to the, to the VMs, and those VMs are, those containers are everywhere. So we had 64 hosts that would do that. On top of that, we have hot storage. So you are using your block image versus you are not using it now. So say that coding has 42% of a return uh, rate. So then we have 600,000 VMs that are not using, used at any point of time. 400,000 are used. So we have to move them to a hot storage area, and then the ones that are not used, we have to move it back to somewhere that is not on Ceph. So that is very similar to EBS and S3. And then on top of that, we had to deploy a lot of servers to San Jose, at the same time to Amsterdam. We had to figure out how F5s and Cisco routers work, and then all sorts of uh, infrastructure problems. Then it comes to the humans. Our biggest problem was different camps of humans 
do not really interact well when they actually form different tribes in your company. So there are the sysops, they go like, your code is buggy as hell, and then the software developer, your VM doesn't work, the network doesn't mount, or this was a problem that we just couldn't solve. That all, all those people were really nice people, but when things go bad, no one wants to take the blame. So the developer says, that's an infrastructure problem, so where's the infrastructure guy? He's in New Zealand, so when he's gonna wake up? And then he's gonna wake up in eight hours, and then eight hours later, he wakes up, the first 30 minutes is that, that's a developer's problem. So developers, when he's gonna wake up? Another eight hours, so he's in Germany. And then I was like, guys, we have to solve these problems. But usually they were both right. So part of the problem was on the infrastructure, part of the problem was on the development side. So it became a hairy problem, so we would spin the wheels. Scaling DevOps is also, when your DNA is not DevOps, is a really hard problem because you don't know who is going to fit your culture? Who is going to actually just you know, be nice to everybody else and actually be, be willing to solve the problem? So this is our story. We are going to become a platform where hopefully your team is going to find it joyful to work in. We are going to fix the communication between your team members. We are going to fix the infrastructure problems that you are experiencing today by making it more efficient. And coding's vision is that hopefully very soon, we are going to eradicate the line between a remote worker and a local worker. So you do not have to have a San Francisco-based developer in your team. You're just going to ask, what's your email? Give your email to me. That person joins that group, sees the entire project communication history, sees that all the VMs that every developer needs are actually provisioned, and only thing that person needs to do is actually commit a line of code and it is ready to go to uh, production. AWS Loft Talks.